And we're live. It's 4 p.m. exactly in the UK. I've just heard Big Ben ringing out those four bongs. No, I can't hear it from Milton Keynes, unfortunately, but I'm so blessed to be here with Matthew James Bailey and Alexandra Hadzik. And we are talking about ethical AI maturity models today because Matthew's put a whole bunch of announcements out and we want to dig into this. So welcome everybody who's joining us. You know the drill. Get in, share opinions, share thoughts, ask questions, share insights, challenge the people that we have today because I think we're, we're done with the talking, aren't we, Matthew? We we're, we're want some action, don't we? Yeah, the time of long academic brochures is over. Now is the time for action to create a new world reality with ethical AI at the center of it. Yeah, it's time for action, Richard. And I'm great to be here with yourself and Alex. Thank you. Well, I don't have the longest attention span of, of everyone in the universe. It's not a great secret, that, to be honest. So these 250-page documents that I'm getting shared with about ethics are, are a challenge for me to, to jump into. I've got to be honest. So when you're talking about an eight-page document here, Matthew, I think we're on the same page with this. Alexandra, how are you? Wonderful. Thank you, Richard, for inviting me here today. And thank you, Matthew, for wonderful arrangements and for, for wonderful initiative that, and for collaboration that we have so i'm grateful to be here today i'm feeling really really honored to be with you here today and i'm looking forward to today's live thank you richard back to you you're very welcome we were getting quite narrow on the screen there so i've spread us out a little bit to give us more room <laughs> in the digital space <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Jerry, you're welcome. Jeremy, you're welcome. Niraj, you're welcome. We so so what? Let's let's just connect the dots here because we put a post out, a little video about this uh, session we're going to do and the announcement that you've made, Matthew, in brief with some links, and then we said let's give away some copies of Matthew's book. And this is an expensive book, right? This is this is a pretty generous offer, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> we said we're going to pick out three winners. It doesn't matter where you're on the world. We will figure something out. If it has to be digital, then so be it. But we really hope this is going to be a physical copy. Yeah, this is that's the, the one. I've got mine behind me as well. <laughs> so do, you talked about wanting to draw one right at the beginning and then a couple at the end. So what do you think, Matthew? So we have a hat. <laughs> <laughs> what we have is technology in the hat, a random number. Oh, gen yes between one and 27. So what we can do, I can put my hand in the hat and press roll and see what comes up for the first winner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. Hello, okay. Diesel, hello. Uh, we need a little drum roll, don't we? Hello, Dwight. Can we... And the winner is number 14 in your list, Richard. Number 14, let me tab across and I'll tell you who that is. Oh my goodness, that is Jaisal Serrano. Would you believe it? Yeah. Congratulations. So, it will be an independent well. audit, I promise you, after <laughs> this. <laughs> so, but Jaisal is number 14 on the list, and she's been chosen. So Jaisal will be getting a book to you. And give us the full title, Matthew. Uh, Inventing World 3.0, Evolutionary Ethics for Artificial Intelligence. And Amazing. Um, I gave a talk, in fact, to London Futurist. You probably know David Wood. Um, yes. Wonderful guy, six times published author. And he put together an event, and I kind of went into some of the depths I've never spoken about in the book. And um, the feedback and the conversation was wonderful. And the event was, uh, was meant to be 90 minutes, Richard. We ended up with an international discussion uh, for two hours, 45 minutes. It was quite marvelous. Wow. And uh, they really enjoyed this new view of the world. So give us a flavor of what that conversation was like. What was some of the pushback? Where was some of the excitement in that conversation of futurists? Yeah, what, uh, so one of the uh, professor uh, from Manhattan University uh, uh, said he was one of the best futurist talks he'd ever heard, which is really generous. Uh, and he's a published author uh, uh, on the next generation of AI, cognitive AI. Um, wonderful man, very, very smart. Um, there were certain people that uh, didn't like the, uh, the, the thought the industrial age mindset uh, was still relevant to take us into the future. And, uh, and that's fine. A different worldview is different, but I just don't behold to that. I think we've seen a mirror 
of, uh, of how poor the industrial mindset has done for us with the UN SDGs, with this 2040 report from MIT that's being validated, we're heading towards tremendous social decline, although it's only a model. Um, so, so the general discussion and agreement was that an evolutionary mindset, i.e. we need a new a maturity in leadership to take humanity forward into ethical centric future was the right approach where we create balance with our environment, AI is supporting us in creating that balance, and it's, it's, it's becoming more of a personalized AI. So there were quite a few people that loved the idea of a personalized life guru and a personalized uh, um, uh, kind of life coach that was working with us so we would move into self-actualization as humanity, um, dealing with the practical aspects of a busy digital life, um, but also supporting us in having the right job, the right career, and for our family to thrive, and for uh, our well-being in general. So they really like that idea um, and that approach. And we're already seeing this, Richard. Um, a couple of other things. I've got the whole presentation on, actually. Um, what else did they have? There was, there was this, oh, yes. Yeah. So the, the conversation around culture was very prominent. Uh, and this and David Wood's going to make this live soon, um, I think, uh, for people to watch. Um, I'm a great believer, Richard, in cultures being empowered to self-determine their future with artificial intelligence based on their values, their beliefs, and for AI to support their advancement and not deletion. And there was a lot of discussion around that. There were some people that didn't like that because they, they, they didn't appreciate certain cultures. Um, but whilst the general agreement was that cultures need to be empowered, whether it's spiritual, religious, social, our personal culture, or our family culture, whatever, business culture, needs uh, AI should support the advancement of that into this new kind of partnership with humanity and machines working together in destiny and singularity together. So that was a really interesting conversation. Uh, um, and the point is this, Richard, we, on MKI, we've got this blog on the three worlds split, haven't we? And mm. my view is this, is that the European Union, America, China are heading towards different destinies with artificial intelligence based on their choices around ethics and their, their, their approach to AI. And whilst some of us may not, well, while some of the... <clears throat> Let's just say some of the agendas coming out of the top level of China are not particularly helpful to democracy. Uh, my view is, is democracy has an opportunity to shine and to invite those that are not happy with a particular cultural paradigm to be invited into this shiny democratic paradigm. So I think democracy is being asked to stand up as a beacon and in, in, invite those that are not happy within a particular cultural paradigm to move into if you like, a bright, shiny paradigm that's democratic-based. And, um, you know, don't forget that, you know, m most of Chinese fall in love like we do. They have families like we do. It's just a particular agenda that we need to be prudent about because, you know, it, it, there are some pretty naughty things going on. But that's not everybody in China. So there was a lot of conversation around cultures and about having to accept that everybody's equal and everybody has a sovereign choice. But being brilliant in our democracy. Alexandra, Matthew, I mean, do you feel that there's revolution in the air? Yeah. We, there's a lot of market forces, there's a lot of world forces colliding at once at this time in history. Mm -hmm. um, the human nature, of course, is always to move away from pain more than it is to move to pleasure. If you want to test this out, you know, finding 20 pounds in the street, it's nice. Like losing 20 pounds is really painful <laughs> like they're, they're not in equal balance and there's there's that an element of that really i think the ipcc report about climate change i think a lot of us knew what was going to be in there but this is harrowing i mean this is borderline pushing towards global levels of depression isn't it yeah that's what the report in 2040 talks about and um we've got about 10 years to make an adjustment and uh, Klaus Schwab, uh, who founded the World Economic Forum, talks about, and I think most people understand this, ESGs or triple bottom line economies, which is people, planet, planet and profit being the new measure. And I think what we're seeing is, Richard, a, an invitation to humanity to mature its mindset, to understand that we have a destiny, but we also need to protect the destiny of generations to come and give them a platform 
not beholden to our industrial issues, but give them a platform that allows them to be liberated from those and to move forward in purpose and meaning into 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 futures beyond our imagination today. Um, you know, that's where I think we're at at the moment. And one of the conversations we had, and it's in the book, is Richard Alex, does AI delete certain aspects of our humanity and characteristics that are not healthy? And does it support and evolve certain characteristics that are the brilliance of our human uh, self, such as magnity of soul, justice, ambition, friendliness, trustworthiness? Do we uh, 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 create an AI personalized that basically supports those characteristics to evolve so we move beyond the greed and the idiocracy paradigm and the rhetoric of politicians uh, into an, a, a new paradigm where we're kind of evolving in our characteristics as a human species that's sitting on this organic template. Thank you, Matthew, for raising that question. And I think it leads us to bias, uh, unconscious bias that we will be discussing at the MKI Inclusive Forum on upcoming Thursday on 19th August. So um, I would like to highlight some answers uh, that we got from um, members and from audience in the meantime. So we definitely, according to Michaela, that's the data, she's the data scientist at Rootstrap and girls in tech co-managing director. She highlighted that we should be aware of our own bias and double check our assumptions test the models with real people, check accuracy for each group, and have balanced data sets and have a diverse team. As you know, MKI is supports diversity and inclusivity at the first place. And we definitely want to share that message and encourage other communities, countries, governments to support that idea of uh, diversity and inclusivity in terms of culture, in terms of language and in terms of principles that we are guided by because if we don't balance um, principles in ourselves we'll see only chaos around us. However, if we if we work on ourselves, if we, we start from from single 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 person will spread that message to more people and that's that's actually what Matthew is doing and it's a pleasure to see more people uh, speaking out that's true that's also what MKI is doing so whether you are a person um, or an organization or a, a regulation body you have that power to use uh, emerging technologies for uh, profits or for purpose and we are going towards purpose. So it's, it's beautiful that you highlighted that, Matthew, because uh, unconscious bias, confirmation bias, bias in all terms are definitely something that needs to be discussed. It can't be just eliminated, but it is there. But it is there to teach us who we are and maybe to dig a little deeper on our origins and on on what is our true potential and if we are misusing it. So thank you. Back to you, Matthew. Well, that's great. What a beautiful, insightful um, set of words and a little thesis. I mean, that's on the money. Um, you know, the culture is is everything. Uh, and the book talks about culture throughout, as, you pro as you're probably aware. And I, I, I've been in conversations. With, if you look, people are following what's in the book. And I know that's a bit of a claim, but it's true. Uh, the Alan Turing Institute is starting to look at culture in AI. There's an initiative from uh, the Austrian, uh, one of the Austrian research uh, universities about how to codify democracy, right? That's codifying culture. And, the, you know, the book talks about that too. So, you know, these are, th th this, is, this is where we're heading, Alex, is we're looking at how do we ensure that culture is, is understood and honored by artificial intelligence, whether it's... Uh, 
I'm it sure we'll back in a moment. This is a life of Brian moment, whether it's <laughs> we have to hear the, honor the technology. <laughs> Matthew, you're oh, back yeah. with us, right? No, I don't know where I got to. But basically, culture is everything. And this is why um, we can't have bland ethical quality. We need uh, di diverse uh, uh, um, uh, 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 certification of uh, ethical AI that that, 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 uh, that allows for the differences in the culture. And once we baseline and understand what those ethical principles are for a culture, then we, and, and we have certification, there's a couple of things that are really good here. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is it's transparency, right? And we don't have transparency in artificial intelligence today at all, right? Um, you can do your responsible AI practices, you can do your ethical AI, best governance things, good luck, it's still heading to chaos. So having a certification model that is transparent to the certain ethical values and the qualities of AI that cultures want enables them to protect the importing of AI into their borders or into their communities or whatever. But also it allows cultures to see commonality <clears throat> in their ethical AI quality, and that allows for collaboration and exchange. Let's talk a few numbers there, Matthew. We've, we've covered so much already, evolution through technology, true potential, there's things that we can come back to if there's time on this. But you, you've talked about the three world split. You've written about it on MKI as well. So thank you very much for contributing that uh, copy. There's, um, there's, a, there's a huge imbalance. So 80% of all investment into blockchain and AI is into two regions, US and China, no surprise there. The European Union has by far the number of researchers in this area by some way, but investment only 7%. UK, 4 or 5% maybe on that. So now we're looking at 8%, maybe 7% for the rest of the world for another maybe, what, 4 billion, 5 billion people. Yeah. So there, do you see that these emerging countries in AI are going to have to take on the US innovation model, take on the, the China model, or take on the EU model, or, or will they be devising their own models, do you think, that better suit their culture and the way that they want this evolution to work? Yeah, one of the key things is that nations, regions, communities can self-determine their future. And so it's very much any nation that is responsible to its citizens will self-determine its future, which is investment, in AI infrastructure, investment in uh, education, stimulating entrepreneurship, and actually encouraging innovation internally within the country to self-determine their future. When partnership with, 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 with some of the technology companies does make sense, but they have to ensure they're not importing their Western civilization values that basically go against the, uh, the, the principles of and, and the cultural values of those particular nations. Um, a couple of things to say here. I believe we're heading towards horizontal government. Um, blockchain is very much about uh, uh, across the edge, isn't it? It's about distributed control, distributed agency, right? Um, we're seeing edge compute, whether in cities or whether it's in your home or whether it's in buildings, it doesn't really matter. We're starting to see decision-making coming to the edge, which is a horizontal play. So I think what we're seeing is more of a horizontal change in government um, and a horizontal change uh, in, in, in uh, technology solutions working across the edge and not being beholden to the cloud. And this has a lot of advantages. First of all, you have a protection barrier from invasion from the cloud, um, from those that want to do ill to a particular nation. Uh, and secondly, it's cheaper because there's less costs in terms of doing that. And thirdly, it's more performant because everything's at the edge. So I think the blockchain is a super phenomenon, Richard, and it is confirming that we're moving towards horizontal types of uh, ICT architectures that map into this kind of local empowerment to self-determine the future. <clears throat> uh, Alexandra Matthew talks about codifying culture, perhaps even codifying ethics, if I put my own words on that. The, how, how do you find that that, relates to evolution i mean if i'm going to be very stereotypical here you know my grandparents have got certain views that uh, i wouldn't repeat here my parents have got certain super views and if i ever get around to having kids one of these days i'm sure they'll be 
far more sentient than I'll ever be about these kind of worldviews and inclusion. So how does it land on you when we hear about codifying culture in, you know, into AI and data data sets with this sort of fluency and of, of, of evolving views and maybe even compassion in the world? Hmm. Hmm. This is a really interesting question, Richard. Thank you for for that. Um, I think what both of you, my, uh, which I agree with what Matthew said and what you mentioned, and I wanted to highlight the the fact that this evolution is um, it's not just natural process anymore because uh, from the from the moment that it became enhanced by technology, uh, it's not uh, only human in the story. So we are not the main character anymore. We have some friends <laughs> over there. Um, going back to, to the topic and to the, to the idea of unification and uh, divide, and that we have now, uh, I think, I don't think that we have a right to divide because if there are only a few top countries that uh, want to discuss the whole course of using technology in ethical way and that is shaping ethical principles that are not always supporting pure human values, we are not speaking about dividing something, we are speaking about totalitarian approach and that's not the future that we want for the upcoming generations to face and that they need to to be resolving so as a representative of gen z as we as we concluded a few a few moments ago uh i think that there is a huge potential first in um redesigning rethinking and um uh, Re and encouraging uh, to change the educational system itself because we are not we are far from industrial revolution I think we all agree on that and we need some new sphere some new system some new framework that will support a creative and innovative thinking so that uh, generations don't learn something by heart or how it is written in history, rather to encourage them to shape their own views or um, re that are related to current situation that they are facing. We can see a lot of potential, a lot of startups, a lot of concepts, uh, models, for example, I, I also want to highlight Matthew's upcoming AI, AI model. Um, we we need more things like this, and we need more books like Matthews, and we need more free thinking and free speech uh, in order to um, shape the world differently. Accord, uh, that is supportive, that is uh, supporting human values, and that is supporting this concept of evolution because um in the throughout the history we have seen many powerful civilizations that um uh, emerge to have a huge power but it's up to them and it's up to us at this uh, mo moment of evolution if we are going to nurture our planet that we are on if we are going to use that power um, and the quotation marks that we have with AI, uh, if we'll use it for for good, for for beneficial use or not. And um, to summarize, it's it's not a, it's not anymore about power or purpose. It's up to our it's up to our existence. Will there be people a few generations from now? Back yeah, that's, to... that's really good and. Um, you know, Darwin talks about survival of the fittest, which is what we've understood, right? Evolution and ethics. He was the first one to put it together. Evolutionary ethics for artificial intelligence shifts the paradigm completely. This is not survival of the fittest. This is about an ethical framework to bring humanity and artificial intelligence together <clears throat> in alignment, ethical alignment, to advance into the future together 
to create beautiful futures and wonderful futures and help us to advance beyond what we have today, which is a chaotic paradigm. And so this really is about choosing the destiny of humanity and humankind well, but equipping people to be able to, um, to, be able to self-determine and innovate their future. Um, so beautiful, once again, Alex, I mean, you know, that's great. <laughs> you know, the book is all about inventing a new world reality and enabling everybody in a simple to understand narrative with the right tools and the right education program and exercises to set the standard for artificial intelligence. And this hasn't been done before. It's been hidden behind ivory towers. It's been hidden in re research labs. It's doing some great things in society, but now is the time for us to lay the ethical foundation for artificial intelligence in its digital genetics. Initially, it'll be black box, but the book talks about how to put base pairs, cultural principles inside artificial intelligence, so that as it evolves into cognitive AI and other types of artificial intelligence, that may be able to make, uh, kind of have an understanding of its context in the world, start to become maybe self-aware, start to have something equivalent to humanity and how we reason, um, then we need to make sure that ethical foundations in there so it doesn't go awry and doesn't go crazy, you know, and kind of to Stephen Hawking's got the point of view, delete humanity. Um, so now is the time to get the, the ethical foundation for AI rights. So as it evolves, it's evolving from an ethical foundation. Absolutely agree, Matthew. So we've got a que question from Kimberly coming in live. I'll just comprehend that and, and remark a little bit about what you both said. As I listen to you, Alexandra, I think about those terms like industry 4.0 and digital transformation, and I'm suddenly struck by how old fashioned they sound kind of old language, old models, which isn't surprising when you talk to the boardroom still, you know, some are still talking about CSR, you know, CSR, this kind of, well, what shouldn't we ought to maybe do something a little bit, you know, and even ESG, I mean, it is still like, you know, a side thought as we see the world on fire. So they're just the wrong terms, these things anymore for clearly not business as usual. Matthew, I'd love to I'd love to understand, so somebody's watching this, maybe a CEO or someone in government, and they reach out to me and say, that was really interesting, kind of, but, but what do we do? And I think maybe you've got some slides and thoughts on that that we can share, but let, let's dip into Kimberly's questions while it's live. How do you address ethical evolution if not everyone in the world has access to the same technology? So, of course, we're talking about the digital divide here. It will be very difficult to change the paradigms. The largest governments ultimately disagree on how AI will get used and by whom. You touched a little bit on. Thank you for that question, Kimberly. You've touched a little on that already, Matthew and Kimberly. Do check out Matthew's blogs on mki.org about the three world split. Before we move on to that, um, what what this looks like in practice, Matthew? Do you want to add any more to that question? Yeah. Um, first of all, Kimberly, thanks for the question. It's a very good one. And this is a question of inner authority and a question of um, uh, uh, power to self-determine the future. And the power uh, has always been with the people. The power has always been in our hands. So to Kimberly's question, uh, and uh, I'll, I, can, I can show a slide uh, that actually, well, it kind of goes into how communities and regions can digitally succeed from a nation. If, Typically, regions and cities run faster in innovation and communities than government. And, and that's okay. It's just the way the government is. Sometimes it's, it's cumbersome, right? So we can self-determine our future. Now, do we have access to the technology? Well, AI is pretty readily available. Uh, you can even put it on a Raspberry Pi, certain simple aspects of artificial intelligence. Um, so, so the book explains how communities or, or organizations can kind of self-determine their own future, not being beholden to big tech or uh, being beholden to uh, governments that may still be on catch-up in terms of the ethical framework for their nation. And that's really important. Um, you know, we kind of, this is an inner authority choice for us to be empowered to, to self-determine our future. So <clears throat> the technology is there. The, the, the ICT, things like Raspberry Pis or buying an edge compute or, you know, doing your own uh, little fiber networks or, or kind of uh, <clears throat> Wi-Fi networks or even wireless networks, you can buy these, you can invest in these and build them. You know, you can invest in 
very small uh, data centers or, or supercomputing centers, really small ones that still give you a ch uh, an opportunity to train specific AIs. You can start to say, well, what, what's our vision for our community? What's our vision for our organization? What's a vision for our region? What's our vision for the relationship with the planet and partnership with the environment? What's our vision around regenerative and circular economy? What's our vision around education? What's our vision around smart home or, or smart communities or whatever it is? You know, what's our vision? And then as you start to put together a constitution of what your vision is, then you can start looking at, at artificial intelligence, how it needs to serve that and bringing your cultural principles or your values as the pillars to make sure they're integrated into those visions and then start to deliver it and innovate it. So Kimberly, uh, it's always been in our hands and don't believe the, the articles that say that it's not in our hands because it is. And in World 3.0, we have some global metrics, Richard. Um, and in World 1.0, ICT and AI is non-democratized, right? It's controlled by an elite number of companies, all the ICT infrastructure for AI, the uh, and, and they kind of control it all, right? In World 3.0, because we've reached a mature mindset, because we're about sovereignty, then it's democratized. The ICT infrastructure is democratized. It's owned by uh, or, or, in, or controlled by regions. Um, the uh, AI innovation is, is, is democratized. So we have lots of students, lots of startups, lots of new agility to, to invent AI to serve the particular community, culture, or region in which they're existing. And this is why having uh, a border control for the ethical quality, what it means is that regions can say, well, hold on, we have a common ethical AI standard. We can actually start securely exchanging AI and we can all start moving forward together quickly because we're working together on the same ethical mindset and the same ethical standards. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. And Kimberly, do say if that was um, useful with the question that you asked, is this still a top-down uh, business project and program in, in corporations, governments, and so on, Matthew? I mean, have you got to get your top officer on board on this? Yeah, it's always helped. To, it, it, it always helps to get the C-suite involved, right? And I, I, th I think there's a... <clears throat> what I think we're seeing are a couple of things. We're seeing, um, we're seeing a push by academia uh into all these different governance practices right but they have no experience of doing global digital transformation change they have no experience of scaling digital phenomena they've not been at the edge which is where i've been mm -hmm. observed operating for the last 10 years right um and we're also <coughs> seeing what i believe is nice words around yes we want ethical ai responsible ai but actually we're seeing the opposite in play this is kind of an art of war strategy where actually what we're really seeing is disruption so those don't occur. Um, you know, if, if Google or other big tech companies are really serious about ethical AI, then they would have created or started a standards body about certification and maturity, but they haven't done that. And nor, <clears throat> excuse me, and nor are the academic institutes. Um, so so, so I, what I believe we're seeing is basically confusion. And so the best thing to do is to say, well, good for you. Here's a framework for us to get going and start to innovate. And we'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to innovate past you. We're going to actually start building our vision for, for our, our, our culture, our vision for our community, our vision for the world. We're going to get on and start building that for you. And, and what that will do is that will start creating momentum in a, in a region or a nation or even across the world that will make what's currently in play look redundant old age very very old and that's what we need to do is create momentum richard and alex and get people innovating in this new ethical centric futures with tools that will assist them <clears throat> hmm. You've got so, some slides, so, Matthew. so to answer your question yes we do need to get the c-suite in <laughs> what i think we're seeing is uh, we need to support the C-suite, the CXOs, Richard. They're probably caught between uh, shareholder values and they're probably caught between kind of this is probably the right thing to do for our business. So I think that 
what's needed, and, and we offer this on AIethics.world, is confidential conversation with CXOs where they can be in a place of openness about discussing some of the issues, and I, I we can help navigate those for them. I, I believe that <coughs> CXOs are caught between these different pools, Richard, and supporting the CXOs so that maybe they can um, feel encouraged to start a, 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 a an internal project to start to play and explore ethical AI, uh, mm. to have in, incubate projects internally so that that can actually uh, give them the comfortability for measures and metrics to then go to the board and say, I believe we should start scaling this. And being pragmatic and sensible because businesses need to make money, that's important. So I think we need to nurture the CXOs and give them a, a voice of, you know, not of this, so much of this is thou shalt do this and you're not good enough because you have bias in here. You know, we need to move beyond the polarity of that idiocracy and come to a place where we're saying, look, let's build something wonderful. It's inclusive. It's about diversity. It is about businesses doing really, really well. But it's also about us being excited about innovating a new future. And so I do believe there is this kind of nurturing and this kind of a place for CXOs to have a confidential voice to talk about some of these issues because they're under a lot of pressure, Richard. Yeah, the quarterly forecast doesn't go away overnight. <laughs> Do you have some visuals, Matthew, that you can share with us? Yeah, I can, I can share a few things with you. Um, so let's see whether this works. Yeah, I was prompted to that question by Niraj, and I'll put your screen up just in a moment there, you know, asking about the role and incentivizing employees and then the way you responded to Kimberley to say a little bit like 1984, really, the novel, you know, the power is in the hands of the masses, always has been, always will be, but they have to grab it and so on. They do. So I'm going to share a couple of slides. Um, this is, this is, yeah, this is, coming on now, yeah. Great. So... The, you know, it's very simple what, what it says here. This, you know, there's about 6,000 languages spoken in the world, but only half have been spoken by children. So it does suggest that we're seeing an enormous deletion of culture. And culture creates our diversity within society. It enriches our human story. So, you know, we have uh, half a billion people uh, that are officially subscribed to the Tibetan philosophy and we, you know, the Red Cloud, this is the, this is a poster from one of my friends, um, New Red Cloud, personally, the great Native American leader. He has 10, he, he stated 10 commandments for the uh, nearly 7 million Native American tribes in North America. But, you know, Richard, we have uh, all these different countries and within them there's national cultures, subcultures, personal cultures, family cultures. There's all sorts of different cultures. And what we don't want is artificial intelligence to create a monolithic culture. That would destroy our diversity. So how do we use artificial intelligence to honor the, our diversity in cultures and advance them into the future? And that's how the book explains profoundly on how we actually do that. Because we want a diverse, enriched society, I believe, and not particularly a monolithic uh, uh, kind of Western civilization paradigm. Um, so let me just move on to, um, hold on a tick, let's just go through this. This one here, let me show you this slide. So the ethical AI classification maturity model, let me just share a little bit about this. So you're all, everybody's aware of Alan Turing, right? The, the wonderful man that uh, was, a seeker of knowledge and truth, right? Through subjective questions to obje achieve objective outcomes. What he was focusing on was how do we measure the human quality of, or does a machine or AI show the similar human qualities to, uh, uh, to a human? And there's no AI today that exists that has passed that, that Turing test. Now, what I believe we need to do, Richard, is move beyond the pass and failure outcome but to start to create a, 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 a way of looking at the depth of ethics that are being uh, incorporated within artificial intelligence and to be able to measure those, okay? So the ethical AI uh, classification certification maturity model seeks truth and knowledge through 
a series of questions to rank, classify, and certify the ethical quality of AI. So we look at digital uh, 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 question uh, factors. We look at human factors. We look at culture factor uh, 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 influences, policy, regulation, governments, and we also look at the environmental uh, factors as well. Richard, you know, if we are going to have a partnership with uh, and, and rediscover that with our uh, with our planet and our environment then looking at the environmental footprints of artificial intelligence from its origins all the way through to its uh, uh, death or deletion and its evolution that whole environmental measure needs to be put into the ethical question for ai there's no point in ai being on you know data centers that are gener that, you know are using a lot of energy but are basically are not either uh, carbon negative or carbon neutral or even energy neutral right uh, if they're still uh, having a carbon footprint, then then that uh, I believe should be measured in terms of whether they're complying with this environmental centric future we're heading towards. So <clears throat> we look at all sorts of different things like user agency of data. This goes back to the fundamental question, Richard and Alex: is <clears throat> is your digital self should it be under your sovereign control? Is it a, 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 an, an evolutionary aspect of your sovereign self? And if it is, which I believe it is, then you should have user agency of that data, right? And that goes to a fundamental philosophical question around sovereignty of our digital self. And there's a lot of advantages, which we can talk about at another time, but once we do have sovereignty of our digital self, that's when we can start to train personalized AI. We look at things like source trustworthiness, bias, of course, human and digital. We look at the current AI ethics policy and governance in place, and also corporate culture. So those are just a few of the factors that we look at. And what we do, Richard, is we ask a number of questions, measures, um, and then we uh, basically rank them from bronze to platinum, where bronze is 25% ethical and platinum is 100% ethical. And you can start to see <clears throat> you can start to see how social media and smart cities are basically comparing at the moment. Now, there's an advantage to this. One is uh, it allows us to take measures of the ethical quality of AI today, and we shouldn't be embarrassed that we may be bronze or silver, but not platinum. That's okay. It's simply allowing us to create a mirror to ourselves on how well the ethical quality of AI is today. And then what it allows us to do, this maturity model, is to improve uh, the ethical responses or the ethical measurements through the questions to move into gold and platinum centric futures where we're becoming purely ethical in our delivery of artificial intelligence. So this really is about us taking stock today, not being embarrassed. It allows us to set the standard for certain markets so, for example, some markets may be okay at bronze initially. Some markets may be at silver. Some applications may be at gold standard. It allows us to set the standard within borders and also within markets to say this is the quality that all AIs must adhere to in terms of their ethical quality. Um, <clears throat> and also what it does, it allows nations to be able to set the standard for the ethical quality within uh, deployed within their societies, but also to ensure that anything's imported from another country has to measure up to these ethical quality standards and badges that we talk about, right? And so every AI within a nation or a regional community has a classification badge, an AI ethical badge, to mark, like a British kite mark or, or a CE mark, to, to mark its ethical quality. And so really what we're doing is World 1.0 is primarily bronze. What we're moving to is World 3.0, which is platinum centric, or the platinum standard, which is purely ethical centric futures, where the human and the artificial intelligences have finally come together in a common ethical centric paradigm that really is the foundation for the future of humankind. So that's kind of a, a flavor of what the uh, maturity model, uh, the certification maturity model is all about. It's about allowing us to create standards. Standards develop markets. That also stimulates innovation. It also creates new impact in, in society and generates new commerce. It allows us to set the standard. And then it allows us to move 
uh, into platinum standard or ethical centric futures. Um, so that's that's a little bit about the uh, the model. And then what I can do is show you um, a flavor of the brochure. This is draft number one. Um, and we, we're currently uh, <coughs> receiving comments, which will be done this week, uh, uh, Richard and Alex. What we've done is we've made sure the narrative is easy to understand. It's a compact brochure, so it will be eight or nine pages. We've tested it with 50% males and 50% females. We've tested it with people with different cultures and asked for their input. We've tested it with people from different social strata. It's important, I believe, Richard, that uh, we have a narrative that enables the uh, uh, people to understand it and get them going rather than being bogged down in 200 pages of just academic plit. So what we're looking at is basically the how to build an ethical foundation between the human touch and the artificial intelligence touch and create a new evolutionary paradigm that is ethical based, aligning the cultures and aligning the future of AI. So we look into things like uh, uh, ethical centric futures. We then discuss the maturity model and what it's all about. Um, we basically then explain more about the benefits of it, how to use the model, um, and then basically there's kind of a call to action. So that's a little bit about the uh, the maturity model. And as I say, we should have the second draft up and running uh, uh, shortly. Uh, there's a lot more uh, to share, but I'm going to share this slide briefly. I'll go through it very quickly. Now, this probably would take half an hour to discuss, but in the book, it goes through all this, right? But really, it's, what we do in the book is, is propose an, uh, a, a, a new digital set of genetics for artificial intelligence based on the evolutionary base pair paradigm where each base pair is a set, is an individual cultural principle or an AI ethic principle that is integrated into the base pair of artificial intelligence. And this allows cultures to have common base pairs, for example, like let's find, let's reduce our carbon emissions by this much. Let's make sure that our transportation is this efficient. But also it allows communities and groups to self-determine how they actually deliver that, allow the communities and regions to choose how they create impact, choose to decide how AI is going to be operating, rather than being a top-down push, which is thou shalt do this. It's about empowering communities to be create, to put their cultural principles, their vision for artificial intelligence into uh, uh, AI itself through cultural principle programming through AI ethic principles. So I'll stop there briefly. I know I kind of ru uh, rushed through that, but um, that's what I wanted to share with everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very useful. Visually looks great as well. And certainly, as I said at the beginning, I'm on board for eight or nine pages versus 250 pages as we take this thing out and, and try and deliver it. Uh, Antonio, thank you for your comment. Jerry, as well, a question that perhaps we can come to in a moment. Uh, I want to ask about maturity. Alexandra, if, if we'd been having this conversation, let's say mm, 2008, these ideas about uh, ethical quality of AI might seem a little alien, but roll the clock forward and we know that there's as much damage possible from uh, biases in AI models and uh, you know, in terms of particularly social media and what's happened there. It's come to light recently that one of the major social networks allowed large fossil fuel companies to spread anti-climate change propaganda. I mean, that is capitalism at its very, very worst. I will go so far to say that the people involved in that, quite frankly, have got blood on their hands for doing that. Uh, it's about the worst possible thing I think you can do in business is to have a network where you refuse any responsibility of, of what goes out and let your algorithms drive content that can cause that level of harm, as we're seeing now on the IPCC report. Um, but so Matthew talks a lot about maturity, Alexandra. Are we have we matured? Do you think 
you know, maybe 13 years later now, do we understand the impact and damage of digital models and AI in the same way that we understand why we need CE marks on electrics, why we need energy efficiency on devices, why we need to know the CO2 on products, why we need to have organic certification? Are we getting to that level now, do you think, of understanding why this is so important? Thank you, Richard, for raising that question. Well, it's def we are definitely moving forward, but forward to what goal exactly? Uh, we are not stagnating. We are. It's been pretty dynamic <laughs> in the last few, like I would say, twenty years. So AI is isn't something new that just appeared. For example, Samalian brought it to the planet Earth, and now you have. Uh, all the cutting edge technologies but it's actually been around for a quite a, a quite a while and it's not something uh, um, i see i see in many articles that uh, people talk about it like it's something new it's something emerging something exciting but it's actually been involved in our lives in all sorts <laughs> and in all forms that we are both aware and not aware that's where the education part comes into play because um if we don't have it in um, schooling systems uh we need to reprogram ourselves and initiate the way the ways that we are learning about it so we we now everything is accessible all the research papers uh, all the information that's needed whether it is propaganda, as you mentioned, there you can you could always find uh, conspiracy theories, uh, propaganda, or some news that are not uh, right. Uh, but now they have more attention because everything is digital, all digital. They existed. It. It's it's like bias. All this stuff that we qualify as negative uh, has previously existed through course of humanity it's just we we reach that moment where we can see it when we can see its reflection for example when it comes to bias in ai um i would i would uh i would like to 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 read one answer from roger a senior java developer at block x when uh, asked a question how we can do you think we should eliminate bias or how we can enhance um, this? Um, he answered, as the creators of AI, we must first recognize our own biases, diversify our teams so that we'll not be collectively of one biased mind that we then reflect into AI. And people need to be confident to challenge each other. And that's where the maturity comes. So we need, um, as, as Roger highlighted, we need to challenge each other's minds, both conscious and unconscious, to to trigger um, all the all the unconscious things that led us to this point. And once we understand them, once we learn from our mistakes that we made unconsciously, only then we can transcend to to another level of maturity to 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 another phase it's like in life i cannot i cannot um expect the same outcome if i change the structure if i change the point of view and if i change perspective from which i or someone looks at it so to to answer your question i think we are definitely heading to to something but it's up to us if we'll trigger each other's minds to think more innovatively creatively and more strategically um in terms of long run because at this point we are focusing on uh, on short-term results instead uh, instead of long-term results and i'm sure that everybody's uh, parents or everybody's every every parent wants for their child to grow up in nurturing supportive and healthy environments 
but what we are doing now we are forgetting that goal that it is set in the long run rather we not just we as as we as both of you and i but major parts of the governments um, maybe or maybe organizations big tech you name it you got it it's, it's no one's fault and it's everyone's fault it's no one's fault because uh, it's driven by something bigger than, than us and it's everyone's fault because we need to start learning about it to start questioning ourselves on how we can contribute and uh, then take actions to provide that environment of course okay. please Matthew I really like that and what you're really talking about is a softness with ourselves it's about being gentle with ourselves and say you know it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to 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 work together to create a new future uh, and we may stumble and fall but the genius of the human spirit is our intent is to move towards ethical centric futures and I, I really like the softness in this um, and that's why the the ethical AI certification maturity model has a depth to it for softness um, if we just have a brittle you're either ethical or not ethical first of all that doesn't help anybody and it fits the polarity paradigm which we must move beyond and it's it, that's why we need the depth and say, okay, we're at, we're at bronze stroke silver at the moment. Uh, we want to get to gold. Let's baseline where we're at now and get that in place. And then let's work together to move into gold uh, or, or platinum centric futures. I think we need a softness to the conversation. And one of the problems is the data scientists and the AI programmers, the guys that are running the AI governance models and the life cycle are kind of caught in this pressure aren't they alex of you must be ethical you know and you need to deliver and it doesn't help these are people that have want to do well for their company and do well in their job and exactly. so right that's it right and that's that's from the if we if we we mentioned principles that comes from the from the that a forced pushed driving forward comes from the from the male principle like we are going to con to win all these territories together and that softness that you mentioned comes from the from the female principle that's why we need to encourage diversity it's not it's not just uh speaking of, of gendered ai but it's rather we all have those two those two in in each each one of us and we need to encourage both going forward while encouraging softness so it's okay to, to go forward and make a mistake but it's okay to to hug yourself and tell yourself it's perfectly fine no, yeah. no nothing nothing tragically happened we can fix this and we can move forward we can modify the strategy we can always move forward I think that's beautiful, and, and I'll just say one thing before we kind of give Richard a little bit of speaking space. I would invite companies, organizations to create internal projects, research projects, or incubate exploration around ethical AI. Look at the human factors and the digital factors. People are not robots, people. CXOs, they're not robots. They have probably within them the answers that you're looking for, and so... I believe have incubating projects internally with measures and metrics will allow companies to pathfind their future into uh, an, an ethical AI. So that's what I'd say for that. Thank Richard. you, Matthew. It's a conclusion. Thank you both. Wonderful to sit and listen here to you. I'll read out Edward's comment as well. Sustainable life certification and maturity models and standards would be a sensible foundation for horizontal democracy within which ethical AI is able to take a supporting role. Shared knowledge provides ground truthing and trust. So thank you for that comment, Edward Darling. Uh, Jaisal, thank you for joining us. Uh, Karen, tuning in from the bus, how nice to see you too. Um, <laughs> we, do you still have your hat, Matthew? The hat is... Yeah. Can you unlock your phone? <laughs> because we're coming up to the hour and we we always uh, try and keep these to an hour just so people can, you know, fit them into their day and, and 
you going to give us a drum, are you going to give us a drum roll, Richard? Could you hear my drum roll last time? I was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to click on get my. When you're ready. Ready for sure. Okay. okay. Play the drum roll. Go for it. <laughs> Number six. Number six. That's uh, Chachandra Chakra. Congratulations. Uh, so, Congratulations. Be really pleased. Roger, hey, you know, <laughs> Roger, we're wrapping up. But we gave you a mention earlier on. We read out one of your comments. Uh, so we'll tag you on this and you can uh, tune in. It was about 20 minutes ago, right? I think we <laughs> talked about Roger, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. By the way, Edward's comment is, oh, these comments are wonderful. I mean, the, it just yeah. shows the, the wealth of genius and passion and understanding in the MKI community and congratulations to you both. Edward's statement is really quite brilliant. I really like that sustainable life certification. Yeah, yeah, just doing some very, very cool work that we're trying to find the best we can to support and champion. Well, one more, one more name from the digital hat. Okay, so, do you want to do the drum roll? <laughs> all right, we had Jason and Jatendra so far. <laughs> Okay, there's a drum roll. Okay, it's exciting. Number, wait for it. Number, it can't be six or fourteen again. It has to be something different. Twenty. <laughs> That's Henry Kaifman. Yay! So, you you've actually saved me quite a lot of postage money today. <laughs> well, your phone has, if I'm honest, because those are all people <laughs> in the UK. So, and I was willing to ship this wherever. I told Divya that I would send this to India. I've got an e-commerce business. I said, trust me, I can get stuff anywhere. Almost anywhere. <laughs> but um, we uh, we can absolutely put those out. So I'll get in contact with Jaisal Chandra Henry and we'll work out what we can do uh, to get you the copies. I mean, I'd love to have you sign these somehow, Matthew, but whether that's feasible, we'll have to well, work that I out. Is I could send a... Uh, um, I can do a PDF and I can send it to you, which you might be able to print off and kind of fix it to the book or something. Or that would be them. very cool. Yeah. I, yeah, for I sure. Can do that. No problem. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, we've hit the hour, Matthew, but to take us home, I mean, what, what are lessons from today and what are the next actions? I mean, are you ready? Should people be reaching out to you right now and asking these questions and getting you in? Yeah, so, um, well, thanks very much. Well, first of all is that, to everybody, we will absolutely be collaborating with the MKI community. What we're doing at the moment is, uh, and, and, and let me explain why, the narrative and the, the, the incredible participation in this community to seek truth, to move forward artificial intelligence, to benefit humanity, and to benefit everybody in society is quite unique. And so MKI is definitely the right uh, organization, and, I'm, and we're delighted to be here. So we're going to finalize the brochure, the first version this week, Richard. Um, and then we're, we're kind of working out what's next um, and our monetization models. Uh, do we go to crowdfunding to scale this? Uh, do we offer it as part of a three-month program for businesses and organizations to work with us to create their own uh, and deploy their ethical AI certification maturity model? We're kind of exploring business models at the moment. and. Um, mm -hmm. We definitely want to uh, work with MKI and get MKI with this. Um, so watch this space. Ne in the next week, we'll have the first 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 version ready, and then um, and then we'll kind of go public in terms of how you can get involved and stuff. <laughs> I mean, thank you for your kind thank words, God, Matthew. What else are you going to say? Thank you. I mean, I mean, I know it, I know this is international, but I think it's great that Alan Turing was British. MKI came from Britain. And I know we're international, which is really good. I am British. Wouldn't it be great if we created a, a wonderful world paradigm from leaders in the United Kingdom to support our fellow people? It's something we can do. You know, we can be a, a leading light for this world if we want to on these areas, on climate. It's absolutely within our, um, our future if we want it to be. Um, so thank you again for the kind words you said about MKAIs. Those that know me and the organization, if if Matthew and I had a commercial arrangement, I would very much have told you we do not. Matthew yeah. is here because we admire his work. 
uh, that's I think people know how we work by now. We we are just uh, uh, we look into the bigger picture where we can. Um, if you didn't win this, like sure. go and buy it, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, don't. Don't wait for another contest. And, and one, one comment is the the uh, couple of things. Um, um, a late, uh, a very good friend of mine from the Intel Corporation, that's a CTO of the next generation of AI, that's had published 170 patents in AI, edge compute, and, um, yeah. and also data centers. Wrote the foreword, and it's a beautiful foreword that she wrote, Catalin. And we're getting a lot of great feedback, Richard. Uh, a lot of it's private because people really like it but they're in a, a, a little bit of a difficult public situation politically but we haven't had any uh, negative pushback we've been challenged once or twice which is great because no one holds the answers here this is about creating a platform for us to invent our future and we had a wonderful endorsement from the uh, from the guys that created thrive thrive one and thrive two um and you know that had about 90 million views uh, one of the most seen films in the world and uh, Foster Gamble gave us a, a wonderful little uh, little testimonial, which is on AIethics.world. So we're getting it out there, and it's a pleasure to work with um, what I think is the incubator of the future for artificial intelligence and humanity, which is MKI. <laughs> <laughs> what do I say to that? Brilliant. <laughs> save you, my Mike. blushes, Alexandra. Save, <laughs> save our blushes. Not shave our blushes. That's something different. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <on> that. <laughs> Swaramira, anyway. thank you for your comments. Um, uh, yeah, this is um, it's an incredible time, Matthew. Thank you for, for bringing this. There's, you know, I think in some ways you are ahead, and mm. I think there's still some catching up to do. But I, you know, uh, so I said revolutions in the air at the start of this call. It, it is. It has to be. Um, let's get ourselves ready. Alexandra? Totally agree. Couldn't agree more. It was a beautiful discussion and thank you. Thank you for having me here today. And once again, we are so grateful for your contribution, Matthew, and for spreading the word out there in the wild, wild world. We're looking, we're looking forward to, to everything that's to come. You are stars, both of you. Thank you so much for joining me and spending some time on this conversation. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank you everybody, okay. for being here. Thank you for your time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.